everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to, uh, to meet you all. Uh, I'm based here in Massachusetts, uh, the famous and wonderful state of Massachusetts, I would hasten to add. Um, so I've uh, worked in scholarly publishing for about 30 years, and um, I formed uh, ResCognito just over a year, year ago uh, to address um, some of the dialogue that uh, I've been seeing going on in, in scholarly publishing uh, over that time. Um, so a very frequent thing we hear from uh, researchers, librarians, and research funders is that publishing research is too expensive, inflexible, and slow. And publishers and scholarly societies reply by saying, well, you just don't understand all the work that we have to do to, to make things published. And there's some kind of misunderstanding that's gone on for a long time uh, between these groups, because this dialogue doesn't always seem to move forwards. Uh, and in the remaining seven minutes that I have, I'm going to try and explore that and come up with some possible solutions, uh, which means that I'm gonna have to talk very, very fast. Um, so the model I'm going to give you to think about is to ask you what the difference is between a, a, an author object that's been placed on the web and a published object. So what's the difference? Well, there's some language polish. There's some form of review that's often done for free by peer reviewers. There's some mechanical structuring of the document. But I would draw your attention to the assertions that are made about the published object. Someone, someone hopefully who you trust, has made some valuable assertions about that object, which means that you consider it to be published rather than just posted on the web. So the types of assertions I'm talking about are some are very mundane and some are more sophisticated. So like who created the document, what they contributed it, to it, what kind of review it went through, what methods were used, statistical analysis, etc. So a research document on the web plus assertions equals a published document. Now, for historical reasons, these assertions that are associated with a research object have been put inside the document. Because when we were delivering in paper, that was the only physical way that we could establish the credibility of those assertions was to combine them with the object itself and deliver it to the reader. And that's why we have this kind of sausage machine uh, for producing published manuscripts. Uh, authors uh, have to be uh, uh, submit uh, their assertions. Those assertions have to be reviewed in some kind of workflow. Uh, they're then converted from a relational structure into an XML structure. Um, they're transitioned to a production environment. Very often that's offshore, uh, involving human and automated manipulation. At that point, they're then transferred again into a hosting platform, maybe a high wire or an Atapon or a silver chair, where they're again pushed out uh, to uh, uh, tertiary platforms uh, uh, such as bibliographic systems and also reconverted into CSS or HTML uh, or PDF format so that the assertions can be viewed uh, by the reader. So if you actually want to make a change to this workflow today, it involves changing multiple technologies, multiple handoffs, retraining staff, retraining volunteers, vendors, uh, and a quality assurance step at each process to make sure that you haven't broken the connection. Now multiply that out for every journal and every article type, and you can see why our current structure is expensive. So the problems with the inside document approach is that the, the workflow systems are complex to change. There are many fragile handoffs. The documents are suboptimal for the display of assertions. So very often you see this, for the credit terms, for example, with people being recognized by their initials and organized by term rather than by person, which is what you'd really want to see. There's a loss of flexibility. The system's not extensible because some types of formats, such as data sets or software, it's very difficult to put the assertions into the digital object. And there are fragile interdependencies. And the key thing here is that these assertions cost a hundred times more than they should to collect, which is why it's difficult to make these changes. So if we take the use case of collecting credit, 
Authors have to be solicited for the credit information. It then has to be re reviewed in editorial workflow. It has to be converted from relational data to XML. It has to be put through the production processes, transferred to the hosting platforms, and then out to readers in formats which are suboptimal. So is there a better way? Yes, I think that we can leverage the infrastructure which now exists with persistent identifiers to create dynamic forms that collect this kind of information or dynamic checklists. So I think I'm gonna be the first presenter to actually attempt a live demo. And um, so here we have a med archive, I randomly picked this. We see the DOI for this uh, object. We can add this DOI to the end of the ResCognito URL. You can do this with any DOI from data site or Crossref. And when I enter that, we have a dynamically created checklist that relates to this DOI, which shows the authors with their ORCID IDs related to this manuscript. We have other checklists, which I don't have time to go into for data availability or funder information, but I can now identify what this particular individual contributed or they can self-identify. When I click the recognize button, I'm prompted for, uh, to validate my ORCID ID and then the system updates to indicate that this recognition has taken place or this assertion has taken place about what this individual contributed. Because this is structured data, it can be viewed visually, but we can also see it in a table format where we can see the individual's ORCID ID, we can see the assertion that's been made, a link to the DOI and who made the assertion. And these assertions can be made by individuals with an ORCID ID, but they can also be made by institutions. In this case, we're looking at an assertion made by the Earth Sciences Information Partners related to a committee contribution by this particular individual. So enough of the high risk demo, and I'm gonna switch back to the PowerPoint for a couple more slides. So what did you just see? You saw a decentralized workflow architecture based on persistent identifiers that was disconnected from the event of publication and in fact disconnected from any synchronization between the systems that published that object and what I just did to create an assertion. So we're not gating the process with these fragile interconnections. We saw a high fidelity attribution because I had to certify my ORCID ID. What you saw was clean and simple, no cumbersome or, uh, workflow requiring separate registration or iteration. And the quality of the assertion is as good as you would have got had it gone through the manuscript workflow because it's originating in this case with the authors anyway. Most importantly, you saw a 100 times cost reduction in the workflow. So who can an assertion be attributed to? It can be attributed to an ORCID ID or to a, an institution. I, I forgot to show you, but you can associate the raw ID with the institution that makes the assertion and you can create your own checklists. So in summary, collecting and displaying asser assertions is an essential and important part of workflow. But our practice today of putting those assertions into the documents is very expensive. We can rethink that by using PIDs and the PID infrastructure and ResCognito is a service provider that can help you with checklists to do that. So maybe we can bring an end to this dialogue by looking at more constructive ways to do workflows that will drive down the cost, increase the flexibility uh, and speed of publication. I'd love to get your feedback. So if you make a note of this URL here, I've created a checklist using our own system and you can create checklists as well, where you can give me a little bit of feedback on my presentation. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you for this opportunity. And uh, if there's not time for questions, I'm happy to take them in, in Slack. We have plenty of time for questions. Um, uh, and I'm waiting for all of the lovely people to submit theirs, but I have a couple um, that um, I'll just take advantage of the, the opportunity. Um, so um, what is the role for publishers in here? Like if, you know, if you're unbundling assertions um, and publish, uh, publishers are the ones whose primary value add has been 
to some degree, the assertions that they're making as well as all the other work that they do. Uh, and you're di kind of disintermediating the, the, their, one of the things that they're uh, providing. So talk, talk through that a little bit. If I'm a publisher, how do I take advantage of Rescognito or, or benefit from that somehow? So there are certain classes of assertions that the publisher can use Rescognito to drive the cost down of collecting the assertion. So the example I showed of collecting credit or associating a data set with a published object would be examples. There are other types of assertion where the quality that the publisher brings, such as a claim about the type of peer review that was undertaken on the manuscript, which you wouldn't expect the author to make that assertion, you'd look to the institution to make that assertion or the, or the publisher to make that assertion to say, we oversaw the peer review uh, of this particular object. So it, it, it drives out costs and lets scholarly societies uh, and publishing organizations generally focus on the kind of assertions where they add the most value. Um, great, thank you. Uh, from um, Sherry Lake, um, she asks, um, uh, Richard, how would you do this for a non-published item? Um, right now, uh, we only support items that have a DOI issued by Crossref uh, or um, ORCID, uh, sorry, Crossref or, or Datacide. Um, so if you have an unpublished item, if you put it into something like Figshare, you're going to get a DOI and then you can, um, uh, it'll be visible in our system for assertion generation. Um, Aaron asks, uh, is it possible to give credit to organizations? Not right now. No, organizations can make assertions in our system about people and objects, but we're not uh, in any way associating assertions with, with organizations today. Uh, Tim Vines uh, wanted to see more about the data accessibility. I'm not sure um, exactly what. So we have a, a checklist in the system where um, people can assert that the publication is related to other data. I'll, I'll, I'll loop back with Tim and, and send him a, a link to that uh, so he can take a look at that. Um, you got a plus one from uh, Sam Klein. Um, Daniel Nietzschean, can we harvest the assertions from your system via an API? What licenses are you using? Your terms and conditions page does not talk about that. Yes, so um, the uh, URL structure that I just showed where you can add a, an ORCID ID or a, or a DOI to the end of the URL will bring you to a, an HTML generated page. Uh, we are um, looking at funding approaches to offer a JSON API, um, and that will be um, free at some minimal level of usage. But if you want to industrially harvest data from our system, um, we, um, we would expect some kind of financial recompense for that. So there would be a license to do that. Um, the API would also support the deposition of assertions as well. So you saw that the, the assertion creation was on our system right now, but we envisage in the future that people will create assertions in a third party system and use the JSON API to actually deposit the assertion into the platform. Um, and the last question from Anita Bendrowski. Um, so do you control in any way that people not affiliated with the paper would make assertions. I guess, can you control that they don't make assertions? Um, yeah, so um, right now we support assertions in two ways. So um, you can make generalized assertions about any paper, but only the ORCID IDs associated with the paper can make assertions like um, funding sources or data sources that they use. So we envisage kind of both approaches being useful, depending on what kind of assertion we're, we're talking about. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much. Much appreciated.